Glory to God. All right. Well, we're, we're just uh, going to be continuing our teaching here. Like I said, we look, be looking for that sermon, Egypt and all that. That's coming up soon and, real, soon and very soon. We're teaching on the uh, redemptive, redemption, the new and the better covenant. That Wednesday night we finished up uh, talking about the Abrahamic covenant. I'm just going to give you a list of other covenants you can go read about. And um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to go through them real quick. If you don't get to write them down, that's okay. This will be on the internet uh, in a couple of days, and you can go back and listen to it and write down these references, all right? Because I just want to kind of just let them be out there. We'll, we'll make a record of them. You can go back and, go and write them down and study them. <clears throat> but uh, we have several other covenants in the, in the Old Testament that were made um, after the Abrahamic. Remember the Adamic covenant? Uh, God made with Adam in the very beginning was the first. Then the next major covenant was the Abrahamic covenant. God made with Abraham. Then there's a covenant with Noah. That was a covenant of preservation. And God's promise never to destroy the earth by a flood again. We find that in Genesis chapter 16 verses uh, 17 and 18. And then we go and then we read also, um, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 16, 6. Genesis chapter 6 verses 17 uh, and 18. But the whole, whole story is found in verses 9 through 17 and 18. All right, so read all that. Token of the covenant was found in verses 12 and 3. That is the rainbow. The rainbow was given as a sign God would never destroy the earth by flood again. Then there's the covenant in Genesis 21, 22 through 34 of Abraham and Abimelech. Uh, that is the covenant to deal fairly. And the token of the covenant we find in verses 28 through 31. And then Isaiah and Abimelech uh, found in Genesis 26 through, I mean Isaac and Abimelech, not Isaiah, Isaac, Isaac, Abraham's son. And Abimelech, Genesis 26 to 28 through 31. Also a covenant of peace and a covenant meal was given in verse 29. The covenant between Jacob and Laban found in Genesis 31, four, verses 44 through 45. There's the covenant of peace, the token of the covenant, the covenant meal. And, and I'm giving you all this for you to go study, okay? Uh, we, don't want, we, don't, we don't have time to cover all this in the amount of time that we have. We really don't have time. Wow. Was worship that long? Didn't feel like it. My, Hallelujah. Uh, Joshua and the Gibeonites, Genesis 9, 6 through 15. Uh, it's also a covenant of peace. Uh, would not alter the covenant in verses, uh, I mean, that's, that's uh, Genesis 9, 6 through 15. Uh, the covenant offered protection. And then the, what was also, also referred to as the love covenant. Now, let's see, you got, you got to, have to watch how you say things these days because people are so perverse. But it's the love covenant between Jonathan and David. In other words, he loved him as his own soul. They were, they were brothers. It was, a, it was a brotherly love. It was a phileo. It was a brotherly love. Okay. Uh, you have to watch that. We live in such a perverse society. Uh, I just found out they're releasing some movie that that's, deals with pedophilia and necromance, ne necro something, uh, huh? Necrophilia. necrophilia, that is, uh, relations with dead people. And this is filmed and being released in our theaters in America. You know? I mean, you know, and, and people, and somebody said that they were upset because it wasn't being released on Blu ray. Lord help us. There's some sick puppies out there. No, it's just, it's really just devils. It's demonic. All right? So I just say this. The, the love covenant between David and Jonathan was a covenant of brotherly, of, of brotherly love. Find that in 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 4. Um, the covenant of love, the tokens of the covenant, um, given the robe, the garments, the sword, the bow, the girdle. And then the continuation of that covenant found in 1 Samuel 20. Remember, uh, David went and wanted to know if there any of the household of Jonathan so that he could show him mercy. And, and Jonathan's son, remember, he, uh, had, been, had been crippled. They dropped him yeah. trying to escape. And David brought him in and made him his own son and took care of him. And the strength of that covenant. So these, these are different covenants. It'll help you to study that and understand how strong covenant is in the Bible. How strong, God, uh, uh, how strong God's people are. Uh, made reference to covenant and, and so forth. Now, I know you didn't get all that written down, but it's going to be on the internet. Go back and listen to this little section right there at the beginning and write all that stuff down so you can go study it, all right? Hallelujah. Because <clears throat> we do want to start getting into the new and the better covenant. Hallelujah. Uh, praise God. Let's, let's read a few verses here. <clears throat> when Jesus entered in, in, he established the new covenant. Glory to God. Hebrews 9, 12 tells us that he entered in neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, that was not the earthly holy of holies. That was the heavenly holy of holies. Amen. Jesus entered. Remember, if you'll go back and study, you'll find the scripture teaches us that, that um, Moses made the tabernacle 
according to the pattern of the things he saw in heaven. In other words, the earthly tabernacle was a natural representation of the heavenly tabernacle. Amen. Laid out. It's all, you know, you know they, had, they had a mercy seat on, on the earthly tabernacle. There's a mercy seat in heaven. Did y'all know that? There is a mercy seat in heaven. And when Jesus entered in, just like the high priest on earth had to go in once a year, not, with the blood, not, not only with blood for the sins of the people, but for his own sins, he entered into the holy of holies. Only the high priest could go in. Remember, you, got, you go out and study tabernacle, you'll understand there's a lot of types of shadows, a lot of allegories that are all, and they had to be carried out a certain way. Why? Because they were representations of what Jesus was going to do. Mm -hmm. Remember when Moses struck the rock twice in the wilderness? He was not allowed to enter in. Amen. Now, you remember Kid Cass was talking about, you know, the, the water still came out after he struck it twice, but he was not allowed to enter in this. Why? Be, because the allegorical lesson had to be taught that the rock, and who's the rock? I mean, if, you ever, if you ever went to a full gospel business meeting, me and you would know. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. His banner over me is love. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right? I mean, you know, all the full gospel business men be outside waiting to get in. Jesus is. All right, anyway. You know, Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Amen? Hallelujah. And when Moses struck the rock twice, it signified that the one time of entering in was not enough, and God couldn't let that go as an allegory, as a, as a lesson. And so Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land so that people would know that he had disobeyed God in striking the rock twice. So that, because, listen, people will mess stuff up. They'll take a little bit here and a little bit here and build a whole, a whole, a whole doctrine out of it. Are you here? And they will build doctrines on stuff that's not fully, that's not fully whatever, not fully uh, vetted, as it were. You've got to fully vet everything. The, all of it, not just the part you like. We all got our part that we like. But you better take the part you don't like so the part you do like is balanced and, and right and we're in the right perspective, and it, it really works. Yeah, Amen. And so, and so where did I, how did I get off on all that? Oh, yeah. See, and so the high priest would have to enter in once a year. Only, he could only get into the Holy Place. Anybody else tried to go in, they're dead. They're toast. If anybody else tried to get into that place, they would have been killed. And even the high priest had better go in with love for himself or he would have been dead. They tied a rope to his foot. So if he went in and didn't come, and, didn't, and then they stopped hearing the jingle, they just drag him out. Yep. <laughs> Wonder what he did last week. <laughs> Must have done something he shouldn't have done. Well, anyway, are you here? So Jesus entered in once and for all. Jesus only went in once. Now, the Bible teaches us not, not every year as, as the earthly sacrifices did. Why? Because the earthly sacrifices were not enough. They could only atone. When the word, the word that is atoned uh, in the New Testament, the, the, the word atoned in the New Testament that was, is translated, it's not translated from the Greek word atonement. It is not the Greek word atonement. They mistranslated it. Well, they, they used the word they thought that because they were trying to be consistent with theological whatever in that area. But see, atonement means to cover. We're not covered for. We're washed. So Jesus did not go and procure, procure atonement for us. He procured redemption, a washing, a cleansing. Hallelujah. Remember the Bible says in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, it says, if, um, if, if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctify to the purifying of the what? Flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. See, it went a step further. And now that, you read in the ninth and tenth chapters of, uh, or actually the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, you find that he entered in once and for all to obtain an eternal redemption for us. He didn't have to come back down and go every year. He didn't have to ever go to the cross again. It's a one-time one deal. Amen? Somebody say glory. glory. Hallelujah. Well, it was Hebrews 9, 12. Get ready. Neither by the blood of goats and bulls, I'm sorry, goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, let me say this. There are a lot of people who take that scripture and go out and say, when you get saved, you're eternally secure. Well, see, it's eternal redemption. In other words, it's a once deal. God made it a once deal. He made it all once and for all. It's eternal. You don't have to keep going back over and over again, getting saved over and over and over again. But it doesn't mean that you can't mess up. 
And you can't reject the covenant. You can't walk away from it. Mm -hmm. That's right. If you don't believe me, just go read Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Now, I know people don't like that chapter, and they try to come up with all kinds of stuff, but the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews makes it very clear that if you tread underfoot the blood of the Son of God and count the blood of the covenant wherever you were sanctified an unholy thing, there remains no more sacrifice for your sin. Now, that's what it says, whether you like it or not. I know somebody that's done it. And I don't, I'm not, not rejoicing in it. It's the saddest thing I've ever known. They mock the blood of Jesus. They spit in the face of our God. And they were born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost, spoke in tongues, prophesied, floated the gifts of the Spirit. We're not talking about somebody who was just a baby Christian didn't know what they were doing. I knew them. Well, I knew them for years in the Lord. Walked with God. Now they spit in the face of our God. They mock the blood of Jesus. How do you get there? Open yourself up to devils. You'd go down a long way. Amen. Actually, what happened, it started out thinking they knew more than their pastor. I'm about ready to sing that uh, Chris Christopher song. Lord, help me, Jesus. Anyway, hallelujah. Some of you older folks remember that song. Some of you young folks, don't, you don't go look it up. It'll <laughs> scar you. All right. <laughs> I mean, if you're not a Chris Christopherson fan, which I'm not, never was, hallelujah, it could scar you. We don't want you scarred. Hallelujah. They started out thinking they knew more. See, that's, that's what Nathan was talking about. That's when he's picked up something. Be careful. Be careful. There, there is, there, you know, we have, we have, let <laughs> me say, no, 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 okay. <clears throat> Trying so hard to stay with this, I wanted to get some stuff out. You know, you start out in babyhood stage, and you just, I mean, you just, I mean, I mean, when you're little kids and stuff, mommy mom and dad are great things. Also, you get hit teenage years in the natural. You think you know everything. Your parents are the dumbest things. Dumb as a brick. <laughs> Ever had that thought? Your, my parents are just as dumb as a brick. And then all of a sudden, you get about 30, half a few kids of your own, and all of a sudden, my God. I mean, from the time I was 13 to the time I got to 30, my parents must have gone back to school or something. They have become the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life. Oh, man, it's amazing how smart they got in that 17 years. Now, you just, what you really did, you came to realization without knowing it. <laughs> they knew what they were talking about all along. You were the one that was dumber than a brick. You see, smart people learn from other people's experiences. You, you, can, learn, you can learn a lot of lessons two ways. By watching what somebody else did or doing it yourself. And you usually find that when you do it yourself, you go, you, you go through the same challenges and the same thing they went through. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. I tell you, you've got to watch your heart. Yeah. Yes, you do. I'm out. While I'm there, a number of years ago, when, when Dad was still with us, you know, and, and um, for some reason, brother, uh, one of the instructors uh, was not there that day, and, and Dad took his class. For some, and Dad, Dad Hagen took his class. And, and a Ramah student, Leaned there to somebody else after Brother Hagin, the teacher, 20 or 30 minutes, said, who is this old guy? Get him out of here and get Doug Jones back in here. Oh. I mean, if they put the scanner on his head, he may not have had any brain waves. <laughs> <laughs> now, if Brother Doug had heard that, the guy would have been filet mignon. I know, I know him. He wouldn't have put up with that. I mean, you can't even close your books up early in his class. I don't care if it's 10 minutes after. You can't close your books up early in his class. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's earned the right to tell you you can't close your books. The hard way. The hard way. <laughs> but, you know, Brother, brother Hagen was, was who taught Brother Doug. Get this old guy out of here. You know, listen, that's, that's just arrogance. I remember I had a roommate. <laughs> had a roommate. Love my roommate stories. He used to tell us when we went to Rama, he'd be teaching before the end of the year. At Rama. Yeah. You know how that worked. It didn't work. He's not even in the ministry anymore. Hello. 
I, on the other hand, I'm, I'll say this to brag. I'm telling you, if you gotta keep, you got to keep humble, you got to keep the right. I, on the other hand, have taught at Rainbow as a guest, see, as a guest instructor. You see, you have, to, you have to keep things right, and you have to let God bring things in the right time. And it was 30 years after I graduated that I did that. It wasn't the next week. Are you here? So you just keep your heart right. There may be things God's placed in your heart for the future. Don't think they're for right this second. God said, told Abraham at 75, he was saying, his seed would be as the sand of the seashore and the stars of heaven. Isaac didn't show up until he was 100. It's a 25-year process. Yeah. Not that God's promise took 25 years. There's things that had to be worked out. There are things that God had to do. There were adjustments God had to make in people. Sometimes there's just stuff that has to be worked out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, there's a lot of stuff worked out of you. Ooh. It had to be worked out of Abraham. At 87, he still thought he could do it in, in the flesh. Wow. Oh, the Ishmael might live before thee. And it took another 13 years after that to get the promise here. And then he's still working stuff out of Sarah at that time. That went over big. How did I get off on all that? Oh, um, how did I get on that? Hebrews 6, Holy Ghost, that's right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Count the blood of the covenant and the holy thing. See, oh, eternal, eternal redemption. There we go. That, that, was the, that opened the whole door when we went down that whole path. All right. Beam me back, Scotty. All right. Hallelujah. You know, <clears throat> when you walk with God, when you serve God, when you've been born again, you walk with God, your, your redemption is eternally secure. But don't think you can just leave that and go start going in your own direction, doing your own thing, and it doesn't matter what you do, that, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep staying that way. You can walk down a path so far that you reject God. Mm -hmm. I would never do Nobody would ever do that. I told you, I bet somebody, I know somebody that has. Anybody remember Adam? Adam did it. Paul wrote, talked about the two guys, Janice and Jambres, that were, hit, that, that were shipwrecked. Be careful. Amen? Let me get back in my notes here because they just, they just did something weird. All right. Hallelujah. Now, let's go on and read here. Hebrews 8, starting in verse 6. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant <coughs> had been faultless, then there should no place be sought for a second. For finding fault with him, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Stop. Now, the law was a covenant. The law, the covenant of law, was done away with or superseded by Jesus. And I'm saying this for on purpose because there are a lot of people who, if you refer to an Old Testament scripture about doing and obedience and commitment, they say, that's old covenant. But the covenant God refers to was the covenant of the law. The covenant of Abraham is the covenant of promise. And you know what God's, remember we, we talked about this Wednesday night. If you were here Wednesday night, you heard this. How that when God, when, when God told Abraham to take Isaac up into the mountain and sacrifice him as a sacrifice to him, and he took him up there and was about to slay him, but the angel said, don't do that because you withheld not your son, your only son. You know, I'm going to do this for you. And then he says this, because you obeyed my voice, I'm going to do this. That was not the covenant of the law. That was the covenant of promise. And we talked about Wednesday night how that, that, God has done things in his covenant in relationship to us. We still have a side of obedience in relationship to that covenant. And you can't circumvent that by saying that's Old Testament. He makes it very clear here that he's referring to the law of ordinances and all that kind of stuff. The day he took them out of Egypt to lead them out, amen, <clears throat> he made a covenant with them. And in that covenant, he made... A, he made a, uh, a list of ordinances of do's and don'ts and you can'ts and you must do this, you got to do it this way and you got you to sacrifice exactly like this and you can't walk so far on the Sabbath and you can't eat this kind of meat. That, that was all done in the covenant of law. 
Okay? But the covenant of promise still demanded obedience and action. You can't get around that. And so God told Abraham, because you obeyed my voice, then I'm going to do this. See, people act like obey is a four-letter word. It is, but it's not a cuss word. Actually, it's a covenant term. Hello. I'm still back here in Hebrews 8, aren't I? All right. For finally fought with him, he saith, Behold, the days will come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day which I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I will regard them not, saith the Lord. Now remember, the law was added 400 years after the promise. Why? Because of the hardness of their heart. They were boneheads. They got hard-headed. I guess they just thought they could just run up there and throw a sacrifice right there. It was okay if they went out and did everything the law told them not to do. It doesn't work that way. Okay? All right. And he said, I regard the night, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with them in the house of Israel and those, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind. Now, wait a second. He's going to put their what? Now, if their laws and, and write them in their hearts... Now stop here for a second. If he's going to put the law in their mind and in their heart, guess what he wants? You do it. He still wants you to do it. In other words, God, you know, you know I'm preaching right. He put them in your heart and in your mind so you could do them out of the heart and not out of ritualistic obedience. Out of heart obedience. Yep, that's good. He said, my people, he's going to write them in the law, in their heart, in their mind. My people, they're going to have them in their heart, in their mind. There is a moral code. And that's what, you know, we, we understand the Ten Commandments really embrace a moral code that was given to control the flesh, but should be obeyed from the heart. Amen. Society has become more and more secularized, more and more demonized, more and more ungodly. More and more controlled by devils. Well, I don't think you ought to push your religion down my throat. Every time there's an absence of God, we're having atheism pushed down our throat. Amen. Right. Secular humanism regards atheism as their religion. 501c3 IRS code allows a secular humanist to practice the religion of secular humanism and get it as a, as a tax-exempt status religious organization. Thus, Atheism is a religion. By not allowing God to be mentioned, exhibited, or demonstrated on public lands, public properties, public schools, or whatever, we have enforced the, a, a state religion of atheism. The government itself recognizes it as a religion. That religion, the, the, the non-belief in God is a religion. You, get ta you can write your checks to a tax-deductible charitable organization of, uh, of secular humanists and get a tax write-off for it because it is a religious organization. Now talk about enforcement of the state on the church. Hello? Yeah. The first, second amendment was I mean, first Amendment was never written to keep the church out of the state. It was to keep the state out of the church. Because there is a prohibition clause in that, in that um, establishment clause. The, the Congress shall pass no law. Pass no law. Some liberal left-wing radical <clears throat> Supreme Court justices, the Warren Court, determined that by de facto of allowing it, you've established it. No, it said Congress shall pass no law. That was legislation from the bench. Mm -hmm. And they established that, you know, that, that the church could not, that we could not establish a religion. What they've done is they've prohibited. They've violated the second clause, second part of the First Amendment, or nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. Hello? I know some people don't like that. I don't really care. I'm going to say it anyway. I really don't care what they think. It is a demonized mind that believes otherwise. And that's just the truth. 
We need, to, we need to understand, as Christians, we need to understand the political system we operate in. We have, we have been, we've had appointees to the courts that, 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 are, that are atheistic, that don't believe in God, and they're, they're legislating from the bench. So if they just go rule, let them rule, but don't let them legislate from the bench. Hello. The founding father said that you can't, you can't establish it, nor you cannot prohibit it. That's why they put the prohibition clause in there to make sure that somebody didn't stop any establishment. That went over, this all went over real big, but it's still true. Hello? We got, we got a lot of work to do. I said, we got a lot of work to do. That, that even went over bigger. So we got a lot of work to do. Amen. All right. Now, anyway, he put the law in our, mind, in our minds and our hearts. There is a moral code. There is a moral code in humanity. Now, see, this is where I disagree with some of the stuff that's being taught and the, the, the refer to as the radical grace message. I think it's the radical Looney Tune message. Because I believe, see, it's not grace. It is not grace. But, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. You're in the grace of God. God's going to do this. It's designed to appease the moral code that says doing this is wrong. We don't want anybody to feel bad about doing anything. We want, a, we want uh, situational ethics. We want amorality. The word a in front of a word means it, it negates it. Amorality means there's no morals. Situational ethics is uh, embodied. Some, uh, some of you remember the, the 70s song, uh, probably done when they were dropping acid. If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. Got some cool licks in that song. Got some, you know, a nice. It's got a really cool mel medley and all that kind of melody. Uh, it's got, I, I like, I mean, you know, I, if you start singing, I start saying, yeah, there's a road in the distant shore. I mean, you have, oh, yeah, I remember that. But you can't be with the one you love, honey. Love the one you with. That's amorality. That's situational ethics. Hello? That's not godly. You committed to your wife or your husband. You're going to love them to, you know, for the rest of your life. You're committed to them. But they ain't around. Just love the one you're with. You better hope it ain't a donkey. Anyway. That went over real big. <clears throat> no, there's a moral code in us. <coughs> and that, we, we, we do things to hide that moral code. We do drugs. We, we, we get high. Humanity uh, appeases himself with television and video games and, and all kinds of stuff to hide the, 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 the desire in the, in the inner man to be with God. Because that moral code saying you're well lost without God, without hope in this world, you're, you're living in sin. You're living alienated from God. You know, some people say, well, uh, I don't believe in God. Well, he's there. Amen. I tell you what, you know, something we were talking about, we were talking about the other day, Nathan and I riding around and talking about evolution. You know, the faith of scientists to believe that all this randomly happened. Well, they, they created life in the laboratory. Yep, intelligence, intelligentsia with perfect, with perfect scenarios in a controlled environment with all studies and everything. We're able to create a spark. And they say it happened randomly. And then that random life evolved into and mutated into all the life forms you see on earth. That is faith. It takes a lot of faith to believe that. That only one of those things happened. And out of all life on earth, that one, that one thing evolved into everything. The sea creatures, the, the amoebas, the, the microbes, the monkeys, the birds. The what? Yeah, where did that first life come from? It just happened randomly. Wow. That's faith. It takes faith. Hello? Or being educated beyond your intelligence. But anyway, we'll move along since y'all are enjoying this so much. He said, I'm going to write, I'll put my laws in their mind, write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So if you put them in your hearts and your minds, what does he want you to do? Obey them. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for he sh they shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sin, their iniquities, I will remember them more. And that, he said, a new covenant. He made the old first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. 
verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 16 of Hebrews. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my law in their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace be, that, that brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So we have a covenant with God. And it's a covenant of the spirit and not of the flesh. It's a covenant where the laws of God are written in our hearts and our minds and not on tables of stone. Now, if they're written, again, if they're written in your heart and your mind, God wrote them there for you to obey and do. You should be, you should be walking in a higher place than the Jews Amen. under the old covenant. Right. Now, let's be realistic here. We should be walking in a higher place. They that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Amen. The per, God's design and God's purpose in the new covenant is for us to be led by the Spirit, be taught by the Spirit, to be energized by the Spirit. Amen. Glory to God. That we, are, that we obey His voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Well, He's not going to tell you to keep living in sin. Hello. He's going to tell you, listen, when you're doing things wrong, well, he never condemns us. Yeah, but he'll tell you to stop. Remember the woman caught in adultery, caught in the very act, came, they brought him. I love this because it's a bunch of Pharisees and Sadducees caught him, brought him to Jesus, and they said, we caught him in the very act. Where was the guy? You know, he was just as much a part. If they were in the very act, he was just as much a part to what was going on as she was. They're ready to stone her because the speculation was that it was one of them. Is it going to be a cover-up in the Pharisee council? Hello? We're going to kill all the evidence. And then Jesus wrote down and began to write on the ground. Of course, you know, they also speculate. They start writing all different kinds of sin down there. And he said, he that's without sin, let him cast his first stone. Wrote and started writing. And they all started dropping the stone because they saw their sin there and walked out. And she said, one more of their accusers. She said, there are none, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Now, wait a second. He didn't stop right there. See, a lot of people teach, neither do, God doesn't condemn us. Doesn't matter what we do. He said, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you, but stop sinning. Hello? So it wasn't, you know, just a, just a push aside. I don't condemn you. Oh, you're just wonderful, just like you are. He, no, I'm not going to condemn you, but you stop. That's a whole different angle of it than God doesn't condemn us. Hello? And neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. One place he told somebody, don't go and sin. He said, go and sin no more. That's the worst thing come on you. Don't y'all just love this? Hallelujah. You see, we, we, we understand that if we're in covenant with God, there's responsibilities to the different sides of the covenant. Amen. Now, we couldn't redeem ourselves. Jesus redeemed us. Can you say glory to God? I mean, I'm glad Jesus redeemed us. Are you glad Jesus redeemed us? I'm glad he redeemed us. Hallelujah. Come on, stupid thing. Why do you keep doing this to me? Come on. It keeps bumping out and putting up a uh, Word 2004 screen or something. Hallelujah. And I got it saved, too. Glory to God. So, in this new covenant, you know, it's not. It is not after 12. It is not after 12. All right. I watched Star Wars recently. I thought, it is not after 12. All right. <laughs> it is only 11.30. What time is it, church? <laughs> now, the only people that the, that the force didn't work on was Jabba the Hutt and that flying buzz thing, I mean, bead-looking thing. Yeah. This strong willed. You see, your will is be just subjected to God's will. Amen. Now, let me cover this real quick. How many give me how many give me one minute? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got seven more minutes. Thank you. I I went from five down to one just to give you a break. The covenant was not made with us, it was made with Jesus. Remember, God made the covenant between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. We enter into that covenant through the new birth. 
We have access to it through the new birth. And now listen, because it's with God and Jesus, it can never be broken, it can never be disannulled, it can never be done away with. Between God and Jesus. And if any man be in Christ, now let's say, the, the eternity of the covenant is when you are in Christ. How do I get in Christ? You get born again. How do you get un out of Christ? You get unborn again. I don't know how else to say it. You, you count the blood of the covenant wherever you were sanctified an unholy thing. You reject your relationship with God. After coming to full knowledge and full growth and understanding of what you're doing, you make a decision. I want the world instead of God. And you choose it. You're getting out of Christ does not break the covenant between God and Christ. It's still the same covenant. Your participation in it has been relinquished. Does that make sense? Ver See, we kind of get this idea. See, if you think it's between God and you, and they say it can't be broken, then see, see and once I say it, I can't ever get, no, it's, it's between God and Christ. The covenant's between God and, the, and, and Jesus, the man, the man, Christ Jesus. That can never be broken. That can never be disannulled. It can never be done away with. It is forever. Between God and the man, the man, Christ Jesus. However, your participation in or not in it determines whether or not you get the benefits of it. If you don't participate in it, you don't get it. If you begin to participate in it and live in it and then get to a certain place and decide you want out of it, you're not participating in it. All right. Abraham proved his faith toward God and in God by offering Isaac. Obedience made the covenant good. Israel later broke that covenant and went into captivity. They began to walk in disobedience toward the covenant and went into captivity. Now let me say something as a Christian. You can break the covenant with God and enter the captivity. We don't like to hear that. We, we know a lot of, I, 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 told, I told the kids, a lot of what's being taught today under the, under the grace, the radical grace teaching, was taught back in the late 70s and early 80s under extreme righteousness teaching. Some of the exact same concepts were taught under extreme righteousness teaching. I'm the righteousness of God. It don't matter what I do. They're saying the exact same thing. They had a different label on it. And it's, just, it's still not true. It wasn't true then. It's not true now. Disobedience will get you in trouble. Sin will get you in trouble. Hello? Well, I don't believe that. Well, just go ahead and sin a bunch. Find what happens. No, don't do that. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a recommendation. That's a, that, was a, that was a rhetorical, sarcastic implication. You go, you, you go out, listen. How can I not? We live, we live in such a sex-crazy society. It's hard not to talk about. We talk about sin, not talk about sex. God didn't, did not prohibit fornication so people couldn't have fun. It gets you in trouble. Get you pregnant out of wedlock, and then you go have an abortion, then you go killing babies. That won't ever be. I think a woman has a right to do what she wants to her body. Yeah, don't have sex before you're married. You don't have a right to kill a baby. Just, you know, you don't have that right. You're not God. Can God forgive you? Yes. Does it make it right? No. Forgiveness and, and, and condoning are two different things. I said they're two different things. Well, you're a man. What has that got to do with anything? Right is right and wrong is wrong. It doesn't matter what your, your genetic makeup is. You don't have a right to kill babies. Well, I've done it already. God can forgive you. But stop walking around telling everybody it was fetal tissue and it didn't matter what you do with it. It's your body. No, that baby is not your body. It may be growing in your body, but it's not your body. And you don't have a right to kill it. Before I, knew, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. The ma mainstream media won't play the videos of the silent killer where they abort the baby and the baby's moving and trying to get away from the scaffold and all that kind of stuff inside the womb and, and open its mouth and screaming. And they, of course, it's silent because you can't hear it. They won't show that on television. They won't why? Because it'll change, it'll change the whole uh, mantra for everybody. That baby's alive. That baby's trying to get away from being killed. It wants to live. Hello? They won't show that. They, that's, a, that's a man trying to control a woman's body. Are you that weak-minded to believe that stupidity? 
You just been, you just been brainwashed and fed a line. You just been brainwashed. Now we got some crazy laws in our country. In some states, if the mother is shot and 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 and, and then she has a baby in the womb and that baby is killed, they can if the mother wanted the baby, obviously, they can take and charge it for murder. But that same woman can walk down the street to an abortion clinic and have that baby uh, killed in the womb by a doctor, and it's abortion. Now that's lunacy. It's the devaluing of life. Don't think that mom and dad, grandma and granddad aren't next. In geriatric uh, 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 killing. I forgot what they call that. There's a name for it. Huh? Euthanasia for, for the elder. But that's, that's just killing somebody. But there's a term for killing old people. It's, and it starts with the geriatric prefix. Geriatric, you know, that's something where you, you start killing off. The, they don't have a quality of life. Man, I'm getting off on some stuff here. <laughs> don't look at them notes. <laughs> it's already happening. We think socialized medicine, it's not about medicine. It's about, it's about getting control of the, of the money. It's about getting rid of old people. It's about, it's about having enough money to make certain people rich and, and create a socialistic, Marxist-Leninist society. You determine who gets to live. How? By determining whether they get the medicines or the doctor care they, they, they need to. You know, you know, one of the guys who helped write the Obamacare law said this. Remember, they used to, they, they used to say it until they got caught in this after, the, after it rolled out. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your insurance plan, you can keep your insurance plan. Now, now the guy who helped write the Obamacare law said this. If you like your doctor, pay more. Well, that's not what you said. What you said is, I like my doctor, if I like my insurance plan, nothing will change. We're just going to help 30 million people get insurance. If you like your meal plan, you can keep your meal plan. Nothing's going to change. We're just going to feed 30 million extra people. And no costs are going up anywhere. How can we believe this kind of stuff? This is, the, this is what we got going on in our world. People, people believe anything. I know I've, I've diverged, but that's okay. It's still good, right? I don't like it. Well, like the cat. Remember that old cat? Didn't like his fur being run, run, Just tell him to turn around. We'll rub it the other way. So Israel broke the law of covenant and went into captivity. Not, not broke the law, but broke the covenant and went into captivity because of it. It cost them 400 years in, in Egypt, in captivity. Jesus was obedient to God. He walked the sin this walk. He, lived a, he was a perfect sacrifice. He sealed the covenant with his blood. It cannot be broken. God cut the covenant with Abraham to bring forth the nation of Israel. God cut the covenant of Jesus with Jesus to bring forth a holy new nation. 1 Peter 2.24, we are a royal nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that show, show forth the praises of a God. Amen. And then Titus 2.14, this is where I'm stopping this morning and going to, until next week because we're not having church tonight. We are having church. It's the children's program. All right. Titus 2.14. I'm trying to get there. My pages are really st stuck there. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purity unto himself a peculiar people, uh, uh, zealous of good works. Now, we're peculiar in the, in the New Testament Greek means purchased. We are a chosen generation of royal priesthood, a peculiar or purchased people. You are purchased by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. I know I, I went off a couple places there, but, you know. <laughs> Smack. Yeah. Good. Why aren't you preaching about Oh Holy Night? That's next week. We want that Christmas sermon. My Christmas sermons aren't even normal. I mean, my, my, my favorite one, we might even preach it next week if you have. How many of you have ever heard my sermon, The Child Grew Up? All right, I might preach that next week. The Child Grew Up. We love Jesus in the manger. We don't like him on the cross. See, the world can handle Jesus in the manger. They can't handle him on the cross. That was your sneak preview. That's right. That's all you're getting. And the child grew up. The only reason we have Christmas is because of Easter. Had Jesus been born and never gone to the cross, we wouldn't know about him. Three sneak previews in a row. 